to Thursday as the MLB draft uh, is first real baseball action we've seen in a long, long time for the Pirates. The Major League Baseball draft is less than one week away. Let's take a look at the Pittsburgh Pirates general manager Ben Charrington's time in Toronto. This is a big draft for Ben Charrington and the Pittsburgh Pirates. At this time next week, we will already know who the team selected with their first round pick. The draft itself is five rounds and starts on Wednesday, June 10th, and will end on June 11th. The Pittsburgh Pirates have the seventh overall pick in this first round of this year's draft. They have picks 31, 44, 77, 109, 108, my bad, and 138. Those are a lot of high picks giving Ben Charrington a real opportunity to have an impact first class. What can we expect to see from Ben Charrington with his six total collections? So I've been researching Ben Charrington's draft trends in Toronto. Both Charrington and new Pittsburgh Pirates assistant general manager Steve Sanders were in charge of the Blue Jays draft over the past few seasons. Charrington's first season with the Blue Jays was in 2017, and of course he was there in 2018 and 2019 as well. Overall, I looked at three draft classes. One trend that Charrington shares with former general manager Neil Huntington is finding projectable pitchers. The Blue Jays drafted five pitchers during Charrington's tenure, and four of them stood at 6'4 or taller. One can argue this approach did not work for Neil Huntington, so why would it for Charrington? The difference is drafting the right pitchers and developing them the right way. Which Charrington's claim to fame comes in player development both in Boston and in Toronto. Overall, Charrington seems to focus on two primary spots with his draft picks. The infield and the pitcher's mound. During his three drafts in Toronto, the Blue Jays had 16 picks inside the top five rounds. 13 of the 16 picks were infielders or pitchers. More specifically... The Blue Jays selected five right-handed pitchers and not a single left-handed pitcher. Sound familiar? There were several other trends that the Blue Jays seemed to follow with Charrington on the board. Two of those areas were middle infielder and catcher. During his three years, uh, in those three years, the Jays selected eight infielders, with five being middle infielders, four shortstops, and one second baseman, and three catchers. Lastly, of the 16 players drafted, 11 of them were college players, clearly showing a preference. This is all good news for the Pittsburgh Pirates. The team is well-stocked in terms of outfield prospects right now. Just to name a few, they have former first-round pick Travis Swaggerty, second-round pick Cal Mitchell, and breakout prospect Jared Oliva. Charrington has made it clear that he wants to add catching to the system, and he showed in Toronto that he will likely be selecting at least one if not two. He targets college players, which means they will get to the big leagues quicker and hopefully giving Pittsburgh Pirates fans a better product on the field sooner rather than later. And this is why when I think about the draft, when I think about what Charrington is going to do with the seventh overall pick, I think not he won't necessarily be handicapped if Bean or Hancock fall to number seven because I believe those two are no-brainers at 7. But let's say they are both off the board. Veen projected to go as high as 5. Hancock I've seen at 6. And I've seen Hancock even as high as 3 on some draft boards. But when you look at the landscape of this draft, and you and again, it's important to look at draft trends. Because when you get enough data on a general manager, on a certain guy, you sort of start to see... Uh, and be able to make better predictions as to where the Pirates might go on Wednesday night and Thursday night in the draft. And they have seven picks. There's no doubt in my mind that they're going to go catch with one of those seven. Charrington likes to pick the big, tall, projectable right-handed guys, and he also likes to pick uh, the, the middle infielders. So when you look at the class... They're, they're not going to go with the middle infielder unless it's a guy maybe like Nick Gonzalez at number 7. Well, I don't think Gonzalez is going to be around at the 7th overall pick. But I, I'm i starting to think and starting to like Patrick Bailey a, a little bit more. And starting to think that this guy could be who the Pirates go with at number 7. 
just because of the trends that we see from Ben Charrington in his time in Toronto, as well as Steve Sanders, who is now assistant general manager for the Pittsburgh Pirates. I do think Patrick Bailey could be the guy. And again, it's, it's not saying anything bad about, let's say, a guy like Garrett Mitchell. Excellent ball player, excellent outfitter from UCLA. But the Pirates do have Travis Swaggerty, Cal Mitchell, Jared Oliva in their system. So it's not like they're lacking on outfield prospects. With also Brian Reynolds being a going into his second year probably as the future center fielder of this team. They're not lacking from that standpoint. But what where they are lacking from is uh, behind the plate. And that's where they could go with Patrick Bailey. And again, during Sherrington's time... Uh, selecting five right-handed pitchers, and this is all within the top five rounds. And the reason why we're doing that is because uh, the draft on Wednesday and Thursday is only going to be five rounds shortened from the uh, usual 40. No left-handed pitchers. Again, in those 16 picks, 13 of the 16 were infielders or pitchers. So you, you'll have a pretty good idea of where the Pirates are going to stand. They have seven picks. I don't think they're going to spend two on catchers. That, that, that doesn't really sound very very plausible to me. They definitely could because the Pirates do need an influx in catching talent. Right now, they're big league catchers. You've got Jacob Stallings as a starter, Luke Maley behind him. Then you've got uh, John Ryan Murphy. But really, the, the, the prospects that the Pirates hold is, as catchers, Jason Dele, Arden Pabst, Deion Stafford, Christian Kelly... Uh, They don't really have many catching prospects, per se. Patrick Bailey would immediately provide that. But what my fear is when drafting a catcher, and the Pirates have seen this really in their top-tier catching prospects, I don't want to end up with a guy like a Tony Sanchez, who highly touted, highly selected, and busts. I don't want to see a guy like Elias Diaz. He had had an excellent season in 2018, so I'm not... I mean, Diaz had a much better pirate career than Sanchez did, but at the same time, I, I'm sick and tired of these highly touted prospects coming through the system and amounting to nothing. And that happened a lot in the Neil Huntington era, and that's sort of what I got sick of in the Neil Huntington era, was where you'd see these top-tier prospects come up through the system, and they would flop in Pittsburgh. And I don't, I don't want to continue to see that. And I don't think that's going to happen with Ben Charrington because, really, Charrington and Huntington have a lot of similarities when it comes to their drafts. So you might ask, well, why did the Pirates select Charrington if they didn't really like Huntington? I mean, hire Charrington. Well, the the reason simply is, is because Charrington's claim to fame is his player development, and that's where Neil Huntington really, really, really struggled. He drafted some excellent ball players. But him and his staff could not develop those players into the, the, the stars that they needed to be for the Pirates. They were just unable to do that on a whole as an organization. A complete and total failure in player development. And that's why they brought in Travis Williams, brought in player development guys. That's why he brought in Ben Charrington. That's why he brought in Steve Sanders. That's why he hired, why Charrington then went out and hired Derek Shelton. Why Don Kelly is our bench coach. Why Oscar Marine is now our pitching coach. Why the turnover of the staff happened in the first place. Because, simply put, the the model that the Pirates employed, really ever since 2015, with I would say maybe the exception of 18, it was not working. It's why you have regime changes. And it is a big, big, big night on Wednesday for the Pirates, for this franchise, for fans, for the city as a whole. If the Pirates are going to be competitive in the near future, outside of whatever fluke scenario happens in 2020, if they're going to be competitive in their next full season, if they're not going to be a last place team, if they're not going to be the laughing stock of Pittsburgh as they are right now, Wednesday night is going to be the night that sets them up for that future. And I know a lot of you don't really like the MLB draft because it's not the same as the NBA or the NFL where the guys that get drafted are playing with the the professional teams right away. But that's not how it works in baseball. But if you're a true fan and you want to see this team compete 
soon, soon rather than later, which is what Shannon has been able to do. I mean, look how well he stepped the Blue Jays. It all happens Wednesday and Thursday night. If there is a 2020 season, the Pittsburgh Pirates will be without Chris Archer. How will this impact their starting rotation? It remains to be seen if there will be a 2020 MLB season. Odds are the owners and players will eventually reach a deal to prevent the loss of a season. But until that is official, fans of the Pittsburgh Pirates and every other MLB team are stuck waiting and hoping for the best. On Wednesday, the Pittsburgh Pirates revealed that right-handed starting pitcher Chris Archer underwent thoracic outlet surgery. Due to this, if there is a 2020 season, Archer will miss the entirety of it. How does this news impact the Pirates' starting rotation for any potential 2020 season? Before the coronavirus pandemic shut down spring training, the Pittsburgh Pirates had four of their five rotation spots locked up. These four spots belonged to Archer, Joe Musgrove, Trevor Williams, and Mitch Keller. This left three pitcher pitchers battling for the rotation spot. The three pitchers battling for that spot were veteran lefty Derek Holland, Stephen Brault, and Chad Cool. Due to his track record and success this spring, Holland appeared to have grabbed the final rotation spot by the horns. So it is safe to assume he will be in the team starting rotation if and when the season begins. Now, with Archer out for the year, Brault and Cool will have opportunity in front of them. Both Brault and Cool were likely to make the opening day bullpen, while Cool could have been sent to AAA work as a starting pitcher as he works his way back from Tommy John's surgery. It appeared the Pirates were going to be content with rolling Cole as a long man in the bullpen as they continued to rebuild his arm strength and stretch him back out before he made his return to the starting rotation. If there is a spring training 2.0, the battle for the final rotation spot would appear to be between Brault and Cole. Who wins it could hinge on who pitches better as well as how far along the pitcher Pirates brass believes Cole is in his recovery. With Archer on the shelf, look for either Brault or Cool to win the final spot in the team's starting rotation, while the other finds themselves in the Pirate bullpen. The loss of Archer will also have ramifications outside of the starting rotation. If there are trades in season, Archer was going to be one of the team's best trade chips. Now, obviously his trade value is gone. Furthermore, Archer's future as a Pirate will now be in doubt. In addition to there being questions about a pitcher's effectiveness and ability to return following this surgery, he will now hit free agency after the season. Due to this injury, there is no shot that the Pirates will pick up Archer's $11 million option for next season. When the Pittsburgh Pirates acquired Archer at the 2018 trade deadline, it was one of the biggest splash trades in franchise history. Unfortunately, the trade has been a disaster for the Pirates. In addition to Archer pitching the worst baseball of his MLB career in Pittsburgh, he's also been riddled by injury. Adding insult to injury, Austin Meadows and Tyler Glass, now the two main pieces the Pirates gave up for Archer, have turned into stars in Tampa Bay. While the Archer trade may not have worked out on the field for the Bucks, Chris has been a terrific addition to the Pittsburgh community. He is always active in the community and has a big heart. His infectious personality had fans excited about the trade at the time it occurred and created an electric atmosphere at PNC Park the night of his first Pirate start. There is little doubt that Arch has a long, successful broadcasting career ahead of him if he so choose when his playing days are done. Now, the, the Chris Archer neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome that he was dealing with and the reason why he had the surgery on Wednesday, uh, it's the same surgery that sort of ended... Well, not ended. Is Matt Harvey even in the league anymore? Well, it, it's known as the Matt Harvey surgery. That's really what sent Matt Harvey's career into the, the gutter, so to speak. It's what caused the demise of Matt Harvey. And it's really unfortunate because I was looking forward and I was very, very bullish on Chris Archer's 2020 season with Oscar Marine. He really seemed to turn the corner uh, when he almost said, like, screw you to Ray Searage the second half of 19. Now, he, he was shut down with injury at the end of the year. And really, you have to start to wonder if Archer struggles in Pittsburgh were a combination of Ray Searage, a combination of, <clears throat> and maybe even this thoracic outlet syndrome 
being longer lingering than, than we had originally thought because interest